Hello and welcome to this edition of The Hype, where minds collide and ideas amplify. I'm your host, Yang Shengxi, and you can call me Jason. Now, today's episode is about artificial intelligence. Well, you might have guessed from our very futuristic background. So from ChatGPT to Sora, the power of generative AI has never ceased to amaze everybody, right? It's so powerful. Now, about a year ago, when ChatGPT was first introduced, I was among the journalists who stood in front of a camera and introduced the functionality of ChatGPT and immediately followed that with, oh, I didn't write that. ChatGPT wrote what I said for me. Ha ha, it's so amazing. Well, it's since become a very tacky line, but I was among the journalists who contributed to, uh, to that. So, uh, well, after that, I, I reported on all the applications, the implications, the regulations of AI, and all of that we are going to discuss today. Now, before we proceed, I will have to introduce our very distinguished guest joining us in the studio and also online. Now, we have Ms. Gu Xi, who is co-founder of Hicks Academia. And we're also joined by our very own tech reporter, Zhou Yichou. I'm sure you've been following generative AI for the past year. And we're going to discuss so much of that with you. And also, we're joined online by Mr. Jim Fields, who is the CEO of Boostbots. Now, in terms of self-introduction, let's start with you, uh, Ms. Gu Xi. Now, Hicks Academia, it sounds like an education company. Yeah, it is the education company, mm -hmm. and we use AI-driven adaptive conversation to tailor each student's math experience to mm -hmm. their needs. Ah, yeah. okay. So each you, you've been working with AI as well, right, for the past year? Yeah, I'm Joey Cho, the tech reporter of CGTN. I'm covering the news of the artificial intelligence, but I'm also very crazy and very passionate about AI. So I'm also an AI practitioner. Ah. So I uh, use AI to empower our creative products. So, ah, so we'll happy have, to be here. Yes, we'll have so much to talk about. Now, Jim, uh, you're the CEO of BoostBot, so explain to us what BoostBot is and how does it incorporate AI? Thanks, Jason. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me on today. It's a pleasure to get a chance to meet you guys and talk about AI. And what BoostBot does is BoostBot is a tool that helps companies that are wanting to hire influencers on social media with finding influencers around the world to work with on social media marketing campaigns. And so the cool thing about BoostBot is if you do this by yourself, you would spend a lot of time talking to one influencer, but BoostBot has this magical ability to talk to hundreds of influencers on your behalf at the same time. Mm -hmm. And happy to explain a bit more about it later today, but what BoostBot does is it uses a lot of powers related to AI and automation to allow you to do something that used to take many hours and get it done in just a few minutes. Ah, so basically it, it, it is a very smart chatbot that could talk to your creative influencers. That's right, yeah. You can call it like an AI agent. Uh, the idea is that you can actually treat BoostBot like your assistant. And so you can give BoostBot things to do and BoostBot will go off and do it for you. Ah, very cool. Now, it sounds like we are sailing towards the future. And before we move on to the next bit, I also talked to a robot uh, that's infused with an AI chatbot. Here's a clip of my previous encounter with that robot called Xiaohui. Hi, you're tall. Anyway, introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Hui, and I am a robot filled with curiosity and enthusiasm. I love exploring the unknown, whether it's delving into a sci-fi novel or hiking to uncover the mysteries of nature. I believe that the best thing in life is to keep learning and growing. That is very cool, and let's ignore the fact that she's much taller than me. <laughs> and now, let's move on to our next topic, which is Sora. That is all the rage right now. The latest text-to-video tool released by, Ch uh, by ChatGPT's founder, OpenAI, that allows uh, p anyone Ooh. to create high-fidelity videos of up to 60 seconds. That's much longer than the, the, all the other competitors out there in the market, uh, Pika and, and Runway, and that is a very impressive feat. And re recently, I showed a lot of the 
saw our videos to our in-house cameraman at CGTN, uh, of course, they could uh, identify some of the drawbacks. Of course, some of the perspectives were wrong in the video, and some of the uh, uh, texts were gibberish. Uh, that's th the problem with a lot of the AI-generated videos. But on the whole, they are so good uh, as to be able to pass off as some of our stock footages. So it is a very exciting and unnerving future. And before we get into our discussion, here's a clip of uh, when we move, when we went to the street and offices to talk to people about their feelings about Sora. Well, yes, I have heard of Sora. Of course, I've heard about uh, Sora. I just recently heard about Sora. I think Sora is a part of OpenAI. No, I've never heard of Sora. I don't know what it does. I don't know what it is. I don't know much information regarding it. Working in the media industry, uh, I think that there's no one who hasn't heard of the word. Yes, I've heard of Sora. It's gone viral these days. Sora is an open eye text to video generator. It turns texts and paragraphs into videos. Which can create short, high quality, detailed videos with a few very simple prompts. I think it's fascinating. I look forward to learning more about it soon. So Sora is so powerful that it's not being released yet because it could cause a lot of problems down the road, right? So I want to get your sense of what Sora could mean for the future. How do you see its potential? Why not start with you, Ms. Gu? Uh, well, personally, I want to say as a person who works in the education industry mm -hmm. and watching what uh, Sora would be capable of, and I haven't tried it myself. As you said, it's not available in the market, but I'm very thrilled, but also excited because imagine like in the future, we can have just like uh, AI to generate a video uh, based on your idea to give you educational content. Like for example, if you want to learn laws of physics, you don't need to just read text or like having like images, but you have the help of, with the help of the uh, VR technology, you can just directly wondering a like galaxy or just witness the birth of a star was the video and that video imagine it's like totally adaptive and it's also all based on your own curiosity and your own knowledge map and that's crazy ah so it does cut a lot of cost and save a lot of time when it comes to generating educational material yeah you don't you do not only have your own tailor-made ai teacher but your ai journey guide your ai avatar for everything and all it depends on is your imagination and your curiosity. What do you want to learn, right, in this all vast universe? Yes, well, that, that is a very promising future. Yeah. Isha, what do you think? Yeah, we've been focusing on the, first of all, the you know, text to video AI generator is not news. Mm -hmm. We've been focusing and practicing and using the, uh, this AI generator to produce videos uh, last year. But that is runway and pika, just like you, Jason, just mentioned. And they can generate like four seconds to 10 seconds of video clips. But Sora is a whole new thing. I mean, why it is so viral? Because it can generate 60 seconds of videos. And the differences from the four seconds to 60 seconds, that is one minute, is that the theory, mm -hmm. the ground, this, this is a uh, groundbreaking theory is totally different because if the runway and the pika, this is also, they deal with the uh, image from the 2D dimension, mm -hmm. 2D dimension. So they deal with the picture first and they generate the image and then they use, uh, you know, specific parts to make it move. But Sora is a whole new thing. It firstly, I think from my uh, assumption, uh, because OpenAI produce uh, Sora, so you have to, you know, combine the large language models produced and uh, generated by OpenAI with the Sora with a video generator. Because if you, if it have to generate a one minute video, it has to understand the world. By that, I mean it has to understand the physical laws of the world. It have to understand the rules of the world, so that they can understand the relations between objects and objects and you know, objects, one subject with the environment. Mm -hmm. So that is why it is so viral and, mm -hmm. you know, groundbreaking to me. Yes, it is quite ground, groundbreaking because although a lot of the perspectives are still a little bit off, but it understands the relationship of space between like the subject yeah. and its background. And that's not an easy thing to do because when you think about several months ago and we think about AI videos, I used to generate videos based on uh, mid-journey pictures and yeah. we made it move with, with only the head, yes. right? And nothing else. 
and now it's become such such a big leap. I I wonder how how much better it will get three to five months from now. Yeah, right? because the speed of its evolution is so fast. Just like Jason, you just mentioned, we have produced a lot of products, and we have to catch up every evolution of mm. AI. So the speed, the prospects, the future of it is you know I'm personally very looking forward to it. Mm. And Jim, what do you think? Uh, your I think your platform hosts a, a lot of creative professionals there. I think a lot of them are videos, pr video producers and, 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 and YouTubers as well. Uh, do they feel sort of, uh, do they feel some sort of existential crisis? How do they, how do they think about Sora? Yeah, it's a great question. And just to give some background on myself, the reason that we started BoostBot is I actually myself started out as a content creator making videos on YouTube for many years before we started BoostBot, which is a platform to connect you know, YouTube creators and influencers with brands. And as a video creator, it's definitely scary to realize that with a simple text prompt, you can generate a clip that you know would ordinarily take you dozens of hours of planning and production in order to get done. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly for filmmaking, there's probably two industries that are probably most subject to disruption by Sora. Uh, I think the first of them is stock footage. Uh, for example, you could tell Sora, you know, give me a, a shot at nighttime of a Vancouver skyline and Sora could just instantly render that. And so if you were, for example, a drone pilot who usually flew a drone around and got beautiful panoramic photography, Sora could just basically replace your job in an instant. Um, and so I think the second scenario that I think about a lot is, uh, you know, besides stock footage, you also have like really simple uh, corporate photography uh, and also just generating a lot of like really short form ads for social media. Um, but I think personally, I'm not so worried about the ability to replace things like feature length films or television shows. Interestingly, in America, there's a famous uh, producer and actor named Tyler Perry who actually canceled uh, the construction of this very expensive $800 million uh, film production studio and facility because he was so worried about Sora. So I think definitely in Hollywood, people are really worried about this technology disrupting them. But at least so far, I think it's really good at making images. It's really good at making short videos. But I'm not sure if Sora can tell stories yet. Uh, so as a content creator, I still believe that as, as humans, you know, although in some ways we're limited, uh, our ability to tell stories is what makes us unique. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I'm also very interested when you mentioned stock footage, right? Because one of, the, one of the potential uses for Sora that I can imagine is for us to tell it to generate very specific stock footages. Mm -hmm. For example, say I want a five second video of a Chinese developer and a, 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 an American developer uh, studying the development of Huawei phone apps. Like this is very specific, right? So normally you, ha you have to find like two actors to film that. But now with a simple prompt, I think Sora can generate something that's that's quite convincing, provided they, that they get the hands right. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me echo you guys. Off. I just remember that I interviewed with Richard Taylor last year. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the founder of uh, Vita Studio, that is, he produced a special visual effects for the Lord of the Rings, avatars. He told me that with artificial intelligence, something like Sora, the AIGC technology, everybody can do, you know, produce their own films, can be the generator, can produce a big blockbuster kind of style visual, special visual effects. So it kind of can break, the, uh, break down the monopoly of the special effects industries in Hollywood and the worldwide. And give it back to the individual creator. Yeah. And from what I know is uh, they haven't released the, the very latest version yet because yeah. they are afraid that it might trigger some ethical fear or some yeah. like concern that we probably we're going to talk about. And also uh, you just mentioned that uh, now Sora is depending on the precision of your description. Mm -hmm. But in the future, I do believe that it doesn't really need to rely on how precisely we describe it, mm -hmm. but how much they know about this creator. Yes. So that means that Sora would have this database of mm -hmm. each creator mm -hmm. are uh, what we fancy like for me like personally I like pre science fiction and for Steven Spielberg and yeah. he has previous work and it's so easy for Sora to predict what you want you just give them a notion and then they will expand automatically. Yes, yes. For example, if you ask it to generate like a Michael Bay movie, it yeah. will produce a very larger than life uh, action action flick Explosion. That, uh, yeah, yes, everywhere. yes, things like that. <laughs> And it, it comes to another question that I've, it's been bugging me for, 
for, for, for months when, mm -hmm. uh, when all these text to video uh, tools came out is that they got the AI tools, got all their skills and inspirations from human directors, right? Mm -hmm. They studied uh, Steven Spielberg, they studied Michael Bay, right? Uh, so if all these AI tools do replace human film directors, like who are they going to learn after that, mm -hmm. right? Because all the human directors are out of business and if, all, if they got good by learning from human directors, who is going to innovate when it comes to filming, filmmaking techniques and, and, and filmmaking philosophies? Do they have the capability? So Jim, what do you think about this conundrum? Well, I think it's important to remember the way that these AI systems work, right? I think that you know, whether it's these large language models or transformer models, they ingest these giant volumes of data and information and they sort of chew it all up and digest it and, and that's the process. Uh, but I think the problem and limitation of that is that it can only uh, give you information up to the date at which that information was generated. So I don't know if you guys have played, for instance, with ChatGPT. If you ask it a question about a certain date, for instance, about today, it could say, well, the limit of my training data is four months ago, five months ago, six months ago, a year ago. And the thing about people is we're constantly trying new things. We're innovating, we're experimenting. There's new events in news, there's new music. There's all kinds of different things happening all the time. And I think that the fact that, first of all, there's limitations in terms of the data that these systems can ingest, but also just the way that human creative minds work. Uh, I, I'm not convinced that AI can ever really fully emulate or replace this human ability to take two completely different ideas and synthesize them together into something brand new. So I think AI is really good, for instance, for stock footage, right? Because it can assess existing material, process it, digest it, and transform it into something that is sort of similar and new. Um, but is it truly original? I don't know. Hmm. I think hmm. at least in my mind, and maybe I'm just saying this as a YouTuber, but in the foreseeable future, I think that you know humans, we still have this magical ability to uh, be creative and, and do things that are truly original in a way that I think is very, very difficult for at least the current set of AI tools uh, to emulate. But yeah. that's yeah. my perspective as a YouTuber and content creator. Uh, I'm curious to hear what other people think. Yes, uh, well, a, well, that is one big question with AI, right? Can they innovate? And another, another uh, point of contention is that Sora is going to be a, a nightmare for fake news, right? Remember that Trump arrest uh, uh, pictures that we, yeah. we saw several months that ago. That went viral on right? social media. It went viral on social yeah. media. And now imagine with Sora, you have like multiple angles of the incident. Yeah. Right? You have, you have all kinds of styles of like, uh, for example, like uh, 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 cell phone videos, mm -hmm. drone footage, TV live, all of them are fake. Fake by Sora. So, so how, so, so will there be truth? Will, will we truly come to a post-truth era, do you think, as, as a news journalist, Yicho? Yeah, I think I've put that into my uh, you know consideration, and my conclusion is that is that that leaves the two chances for our news agency, oh. because by right <laughs> by then mm -hmm. the internet will be filled with AI you know fake news because uh, AI has mm -hmm. a default that is hallucination that mm -hmm. can generate. Be, for example, if I type how to you know house Monkey King's performance in Zhen Huan Zhuan, one of the top <laughs> TV series <laughs> in China, he will just tell me the answers just, just like it's real. So that is what we call hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And now I've noticed that the internet has already, uh, you know, people have generated the fake news using AI. And uh, I think, you know, just like you mentioned, if we want to find out the truth, we have to go to the library <laughs> to, to use the, you know, paper books yeah. to find out the truth. But that leaves a true opportunity for our news agency mm -hmm. because we are professionals. We can double check the facts. We can solidify the truth. And I think that is for the media industry. Uh, while we're professionals, it's where we can take the roles, we can play roles to uh, provide the truth, the, the, you know, the, tr the, the truth and the news for the audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. at CGTN we would need a new, a whole new department <laughs> just dedicated <laughs> on that, right? But I take a totally opposite mm -hmm. point of view. Mm -hmm. I do think the, the line between truth and not true is actually blurry. Mm -hmm. 
can, can we actually distinguish between them? Like the truth around us, we're reading news, right? There are fake news, even generated by real human beings. That could be fake. But with the generation of this fake news generated by AI, I just felt like, okay, just let it be because information is information. News is news. Probably information is fake information becomes news. So why would we bother to distinguish if it's true or not? So my personal stand is because I'm fully convinced that we're on the path to AGI, the artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I'm like totally convinced and certain that in the future we are like in the oceans of information. There's no mm -hmm. need for us to distinguish the truth and the not true anymore. Uh -huh. yeah. If AGI comes, it might be as smart as to distinguish for us what yeah. fake news is. Yeah, we have our assistant, right? <laughs> yes. yeah. Maybe it will do it for us. Yes. Maybe that Certainly. problem will solve itself. Certainly, yeah. Wow, cool. Well, that's so much for our discussion on, on the news. Uh, while Sora is certainly not the only tool that threatened to take the job of a news presenter, we at CGTN have also been experimenting with all kinds of AI tools that imitate news presenter. For example, well, a lot of our, t our presenters have this AI avatar, uh, well, like this one over here, that is me, uh, who could talk nonstop and speak in multiple languages. Here's the taste of what it can do. 你好,我是杨,一名会说中文和英文的双语记者。Con la ayuda de la inteligencia artificial, puedo aprovechar instantáneamente las habilidades de un políglota sans avoir besoin de connaître au préalable d'autres langues étrangères supplémentaires. Halian, yahdut enfijar fi adawat el dhaka el isplinai, mithil chat GPT, wa mid journey, wa heijen, wa sora. Обещающие создавать увлекательные истории, потрясающее искусство и, возможно, снимать собственные полнометражные фильмы. It blows my mind because it sounds exactly like me, even to me. It sounds exactly the like me. Even the same. Yes, yes, and and well, I've always wondered how I would sound speaking Spanish, and now I know, right? And I wish I was this talented. Sounds charming. <laughs> so, thank you. I now have to learn Spanish. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I, <laughs> I'll, I'll just let my anymore. avatar talk for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is created by a, a company called HeyGen. You, you, just feed, you just feed it a minute of a video of you talking. And it could generate a video like this uh, of you talking in all kinds of various languages. So, so, so what, do you think about, what do you think about the implications of these tools? Well, uh, yeah, well, the, the text-to-voice tool is always what impressed me the most, actually, because yeah. I personally use it every day. Because uh -huh. I'm also learning like different languages and also I want to slightly polish my, my languages and also my oral uh, English or other mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. And also I input some text on daily base to test what it sounds like, just like what you did, mm -hmm. to see oh, what, 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 what would I sound like if I put an angry tone to it. And it does a job for me. So I kind of having a lot of fun playing with it. And also I add like news narrator and also uh, like the video narrator, and it sounds totally different, but it all sounds me. Mm -hmm. So that means, just like you said, you subtract my, my voice tone and then start to generate. So it sounds like another Gucci speaking Japanese, mm -hmm. and also another Gucci even speaking Chinese, but in a very angry tone. And it helped me to rehearse if I want to be in an argument with somebody, and I'm like kind of like being intimidated mm -hmm. by the confrontation, like then I'll just like rehearse with this angry tone. Wow. And that helped me a lot. <laughs> wow, it's a, it's a great experimental yeah. tool without actually having to be angry. Yes, <laughs> yeah, without, yes that's yes. true. <laughs> that, that's very true. Jim, what do you think? Like, do, do you, are, are you considering of using something like this for your video creating a career on YouTube? <laughs> yeah, so I have a few interesting stories actually about this technology to share because uh, I've played with it quite a bit and I think it's very interesting. Uh, the first one is, uh, obviously today we're speaking English, but I've been a student of Chinese language for about 20 years. I studied it as a high school student in Silicon Valley where I grew up, continued taking it in college in Boston, and then continued taking it and, and studying after moving to China. And actually, I make videos both for Western social media on YouTube, but also have an account on certain Chinese social media services where I make Chinese language videos. And lately, when these AI tools have been coming out, I've got a lot of people in the comments of my videos on Chinese social media saying, hey, Jim, it seems like you're using AI to translate your English into Chinese. So people assume that my spoken Chinese is actually generated by an AI because 
they assume that I can't actually speak the language. And so it's an interesting thing because, you know, I spent 20 years studying and learning the language, but because of these new AI tools, you can create video of someone speaking any language you like. So on one hand, I feel like, wow, you know, that's a shame that I spent so long studying and, and perfecting my Chinese language. And now the AI can come along and replace it almost instantly. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, there's there's tremendous value to having learned Chinese. And I think it's it's very, very useful for, for my whole life. Uh, but I think there's incredible things you can do with these AI tools. You know, I think now we live in a world where the world is interconnected and people want to communicate with fans in all these different markets. And so, for instance, on YouTube, you have uh, Mr. Beast. He's a very popular YouTuber who's one of the most popular YouTube creators. And he, I think he's either number one or number two in terms of total fan count on the site. But he recently created a second channel, uh, which is Mr. Beast in Spanish, where he's like dubbed and, and I believe used AI to recreate a lot of his videos in Spanish to target the Spanish speaking audience on YouTube. And I think his original channel has, you know, 70, 80 million, 100 million or more followers. But his Spanish language channel already has, I think, six or seven million followers. And so you have this interesting phenomenon now where I think people are going to be able to, you know, communicate across language uh, borders, across national borders and communicate with people and and just do so in a way that is very different than the way they were able to before. Because um, I think, you know, everyone on the line today, we're all multi-language speakers. And although, you know, we study a second language and we can communicate in that language, if someone speaks to you in your language, the language you learned when you were growing up, that's a very profound thing. Um, so I'm really excited about the future, you know, for language learners, you know, and even for instance, for my family, you know, if they come and visit in China, it'll be really great to have a future world where they're able to communicate with people and I don't have to take them around all the time, you know, to take them to restaurants and be the translator. But yeah. I think, yeah, the possibilities are really exciting. Yes, I think you should, you should consider opening up more channels as well. I, I think you, sh you can have a, like a Spanish channel, a Russian channel, an Arabic channel. I, I mean, all YouTubers can instantly at least quadruple their content that they put online. That, and that is very interesting, right? And Ishu, I think you also have your own AI avatar as well. Yes, I've developed my own avatar. And to, you know, I found it very safe times and boost efficiency, right. for example, can help me to catch up with the breaking mm. tech news mm. and broadcast it immediately. But I'm more thinking about, you know, not only to replicate my digital avatar, but to use AIGC to implement the AIGC technology to our workflow. Mm -hmm. So for me, first of all, I use the AIGC, the large language models to the self-trained a model to uh, can be the brain mm -hmm. summarizer. For example, mm -hmm. if we do some mm -hmm. researches on the career the industry, we have to read like loads of paper, and uh, you know it will spend a lot of time. But I train this model so it can summarize the key points and the mm. main, you know, the main points of the out from the paper, out from the research paper, and it can really help me to boost my <coughs> efficiency. Mm. And mm. second of it, I replicate my digital avatar. You know, I think mean, Jason can understand mm. that. You, if yeah. we want to yeah. film something, we have to book the place, book yeah. the photographer, put the makeup, lighting, everything. But I if we already develop our AI avatar, we just give him the text and, uh, you know, it can answer that and broadcast it immediately. For me, it helped me to catch up with broadcasting the breaking news of technologies. Mm -hmm. And third of all, if I want to publish the videos we just mentioned, I can use AI music composers. So mm -hmm. we can customize the music for the for my video, for my you know broadcasting uh, videos, short videos. And when I put it into different social media platforms. Each of the uh, platforms have different characteristics. For example, the X, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, you name it. Uh, different uh, viral posts on different social media platforms have its own uh, characteristics. And uh, I self-trained the model. It can uh, extract the characteristics of different platforms, and I put it a long post, wow. a long article into that model. It can feed back mm -hmm. uh, the post on different platforms immediately. Yes. So I can put it on different social media pl platforms mm -hmm. immediately. And uh, that is how I'm thinking to integrate the AIGC into the workflow, mm -hmm. and not only to just produce a portrait of my replica. Yes, yeah. interesting, because different, different platforms have different styles as yeah, well, right? Yeah. Because, for example, on Xiao Hongshu, this Chinese <laughs> app, they have a lot of emoji before each each yeah. sentences. Yeah. Right, that's the style of that particular platform. Yeah. Uh, so, do you do you consider using something like that to 
for example, to help you with your marketing and things like yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I have my own AI assistant uh, mm -hmm. every day, wow. and it helps me summarize what Rachel does, uh, the, the content, because there's just so much content. And also, we need to catch up with what's trendy on social media and what's like the younger generation are following. So we need to know like the key points. So basically, every day, I open up my laptop, I ask my AI assistant to summarize what's trendy and what's new wow. in specific mm -hmm. territories. Like, well, I'm personally very interested in sports, and I want to know the breaking news of sports and I, I'm like following that specific figures. So I'm kind of like adding different elements and in my interests and like feeding my AI assistant to help him to get to know me more. And then he will know exactly what I want to know and what I want to read about every morning. And also I have the extension attached to my website and it helps me to summarize the videos on all those video platforms mm -hmm. like Bilibili and also YouTube. And what it does for me is I just don't want to take that much time to finish like watching the whole video, yeah. right? Because this is so much yeah. happening, right? And then what this AI does is he summarizes the content based on the subscriptions and also based on like the content that generated also um, by the platform itself. Mm -hmm. So I just need to read the lines mm -hmm. and read the, uh, the framework of the video and it saves me a lot of time. So basically now I don't think I can survive with the help <laughs> of the AI basically every day. Yeah. Yes, video summarizer is a big lifesaver. Yeah. I use that every day as well because I con consume an obnoxious amount of YouTube videos yeah. and sometimes I won't want to research a subject and it, I found a, like a two hour web seminar yeah. on, <laughs> on YouTube. True. Yeah, and, and the summarizer would come in very handy. Especially yeah. in, in like uh, academia um, territory, right? Like mm. when some professors are talking, you yeah. know what they're talking about, right? Yeah. But <laughs> you still kind of like want to wait until he finishes. Mm -hmm. And also the other part is I use AI to, uh, to train me to have a more interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. So it helps me to train my ability mm -hmm. to ask right questions. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't require me to like, oh, hey, you need to like think thoroughly. Mm -hmm. For me now, what's convenient is I just put some very vague concepts, like some like blink of an eye concept, like fleeting uh, concepts and the thoughts, like just like sliding through my brain and mm -hmm. then just throw it to it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just let AI to find the specific information for me instead of me just going on search engine and trying to find that information. Wow. So now I'm just like, oh, the other day I was reading some website and somebody seems to be talking about something. Can you find it for me? Wow. And then he just does the job. Yeah. Ah, wow. <laughs> so now That's... I'm like so enjoying this vague conversation every day. Yeah. Wow. How, how about this? We we all share some unconventional or creative uses of of, of generative AI, whether it's it's text to video or chat GPT. What what are the interesting applications that we can share? Each of you have anything to share? Yeah, large language models is yes, definitely for example, one all of all kinds the... of generative AI. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think of. Uh, for me, I think large language models, LLM, is definitely one of the prominent yeah. applications. Um, for example, I think that we always talk about some technology has some bubble phenomenon, but for me, I think uh, GPT and uh, Wen Xinyan, some large language mm -hmm. models, uh, they're kind of like the new round of industrial revolutions. For example, we, we're always talking about the big data, the industrial digitizations. Mm -hmm. I think China got the sense, the world got the sense to accumulate it, the big data. And for the over the past decade, mm -hmm. we have accumulated huge amounts of data, but we don't have enough p manpower to deal, to process this mm -hmm. data. And for now, the big data, uh, the big uh, large language models got the chance to help us process this uh, this mm -hmm. big amount of data uh, so that it can help to solve the so-called uh, last mile prob problems mm -hmm. for the enterprises, for factories, and for different industries. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm thinking that uh, you know, our mankind, we are now climb on the top of the food chains in the world. And that is because of the <coughs> rep eval uh, 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 evolutions. Mm -hmm. And th that evolution not only depends on our, you know, flash revolution, evolution, but also it's because we can invent tools. And the large language models is one of the greatest tools ever invented by mm. human beings. So we can embrace a new round of changes and, uh, you know, benefits. And that is mm. my opinion of the large language models. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That, 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 because we can always assume that large language models like ChatGPT, they always know more than us, right? Because mm. they have this copious amount of, of, of data that they yeah. that are put into the training. Well, I can mention one of the more interesting use of ChatGPT uh, and other large language models. Like I was on a reporting trip last year 
for example, I went to Istanbul. Mm. I went, we went shooting at one of the historic uh, central areas of Istanbul, and we ran into some of the relics from the Roman Empire era, like predates that predates the is- Islamic era. And I wanted to film a stand up there, and I-, I wanted to say, okay, look at this ancient Egyptian obelisk. It's moved here by Constantine the Great. That's as Roman as it gets. Mm-hmm. I thought I was being clever, clever, right? But right after I shot that, I felt a bit unsure. Like, am I sh- 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 can I be saying that? Can I be saying that this is as Roman as it gets? <laughs> and I'm, I, I was a bit quite unsure about myself. So I asked ChatGPT, can I say that? Can I say it, this is as Roman as it gets? It gives me a lot of example supporting my, uh, oh. my, my stand-up. Because it, it gave me some historic context about how Roman emperors do love to move ancient Egyptian uh, relics around in their empire to, to, to help assert their authority. Uh, it gave me a lot of historical context to support why I could say that without me giving it any hints or suggestions because ChatGPT sometimes just say what you want to hear, right? Yeah, yeah. But I didn't give, give it any hint or suggestion. It just made that connection for me. So that was the time that I felt comfortable I could, I could say that stand up. This is as Roman as it gets because ChatGPT thinks the same as well. Wow, AI knows you now. <laughs> <laughs> so it knows yeah. me now. Yeah, and and knows AI how to comfort you. Yeah. 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 AI knows That's you why I love and it AI now. can com- please you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. true. That's, yes, it's my second crazy. brain now. Yeah. Uh, Jim, what about you? Like, wh- apart from, apart from uh, video making and, uh, and all kinds of uh, AI tools that used in the creative process, what, what, what are some AI applications that you or your friends use daily that that give, sort of gives you a wow moment recently yeah well first of all i think what uh you know icho and and Gucci have talked about is very inspiring and and very grand and and magical i think that actually for me uh the coolest thing about a lot of these tools is as you guys mentioned the ability that they have to learn about you and also the ability for you as a user to tell the system certain things about yourself or give it certain data or certain instructions and then have the systems do things for you. And the example, the stupid example that I'll share, which is a bit embarrassing, but I think is actually uh, instructive, is about recipes. So I don't know if you guys like to cook, uh, but online, if you ever go on the internet and look around for recipes, often uh, there's so many recipes where the person, before they give you the recipe, will give you like an essay about their life and their family history and their pets and all this other information. And then they finally get to the recipe far down the page. And oftentimes the recipe is also very complicated, right? They have lots of different ingredients and they use lots of different units of measurements. They say a splash of this and a scoop of that and, uh, you know, a tablespoon of this. And so you have all these non-standard units of measurement. And for a person like me, who's you know, an aspiring cook, I'm not so good, it's very hard for me to figure out how do I take this complicated recipe and turn it into a grocery list so that I can go to the supermarket and get the things I need to make the food. And so what I did is I made a GPT, a generative pre-trained little assistant with ChatGPT, and it's just called Recipe Bot. And I told Recipe Bot to read the articles about the, the food that I wanna make and extract all the different ingredients from that list and then turn it into a shopping list for me uh, so that I can go to the grocery and get all the things that I need. And although it sounds very basic, uh, it's been an incredibly useful tool because uh, you know, before what I would really struggle, I'd always forget something. You know, I'd go to the grocery store, I'd order things and I'd have nine out of the 10 things I need, but the one thing that's missing is the thing that makes the recipe you know, special. Mm-hmm. And I think in the future, we're probably gonna see a lot more of this, right? All these like, customizations that, you know, pull out just the information you need and extract it from this sea of all the stuff you don't need and are able to make your life a lot more convenient and straightforward and simple. Wow, that, that is very interesting. Now, we've been talking about how AI could be of great assistance for us in the virtual world, but I want to now share an example of how AI could assist our life in the actual physical world, mm. and that is AI plus Robotics and recently I went to to a company in Hangzhou and experienced how AI can be merged with, for example, a cleaning robot. Let's take a look. If you own a cleaning robot, you may have experienced this scenario. That cluster of cat hair has been bugging you all morning. But you simply can't be bothered to sweep it up yourself. After all, what's the point of having a robot? 
so you wait for the device to finally stumble upon it. Oh, come on. This represents a conundrum, leading to the question that has become increasingly popular in 2024. Can AI solve that? To find the answer, I went to China's high-tech hub of Hangzhou. I'm not littering. This bottle will become important later on in the story. This company claims to make a smart cleaning robot that integrates AI. Now it is really awkward for you that you just cannot tell your robot to come over and take care of the mess just in front of you. Yes, that's my point exactly. Okay, now show me how your robot does it. So how does AI make this robot smart? Okay, so this is what we provide here. This is a general robot's brain. Atop an otherwise conventional cleaning vehicle rests a device equipped with cameras and sensors. These components transmit data to a processing unit that's embedded with a chat GPT-like large language model called Tongyi Qianwen, created by China's tech giant Alibaba. As with all such AI tools, we can simply tell the robots what you want in natural human language, and it can understand it. Let's see if it can pick up the bottle I just threw away, just by us telling it to. All right, now this is a live feed. It's now received the command. Oh, it's now on the move. As the camera locked onto the bottle, the sweepers activated automatically. Oh. Whoa, it actually did it. It knows where building three is. It recognizes the bottle. It did what it's supposed to. For example, I wanted to clean a bunch of cat hair in a certain area, and it will go there. Sure. Oh. If only they could make their contraption smaller. Ever since the explosion of generative AI, many people have become acquainted with its artistic and entertainment applications. However, it appears that robots like this one are an example of how it's increasingly being used for industrial purposes. Robots of logistics, robots of patrol, robots of auto charging, like that. Another company in Hangzhou is employing Tongyi Qianwen to imbue their robot arm with the intelligence to comprehend and carry out commands, such as heat a cake in the microwave. These advancements merging generative AI with robotics represent one step in China's ongoing technology upgrades that experts say will present enormous economic potential. Well, I think AI is now merging uh, with the physical world as well, right? Because it, I think I could find a lot of potential uses for it. For example, emergency response, needing a robot to go into a dangerous area and needed to be smart enough to understand our commands, right? Um, for example, we want a robot to take care of the elderly, take care of the child. Yeah. That, that could be a, a very, very uh, promising application and in the future. And conduct surgery. Yes, yes, yes. I was yes. At, um I heard a, a term to describe the the whole scenario is called embedded AI. Ah. It's basically embedding all the behaviors that was like only uh, available for humans and now it could all be conducted by by AI. And mm. it's mind blowing because Nvidia just announced that they launched their own uh, embedded AI division. Mm. And now they are like delving into the whole territory and using like robotics that we just said and automobile and also the drones, the smart cameras to conduct all it's like multi-tasks and also it's integrated with the hardware uh, strength that the NVIDIA has. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing that we can imagine like in the, uh, in the future in the factory and also in hospitals, like the, the daycare places. And then like we can just see all the robots like doing mm -hmm. all this like multi-tasks. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been talking about a lot of the promising possibilities of generative AI, right? But what about the concerns that comes along with it? Well. Recently, we've asked people what they think about uh, the exponential growth of the ability of AI. Yes, um, I do think it definitely has its role, and I do think it makes life a little bit easier and things more fast-paced. Yes, of course, I do think that we need AI. I do think we need AI. There are benefits to it and um, risks as well. There are some parts where I feel like we do need AI and we've been living with AI for the past few years. AI is absolutely 
everywhere. Regarding, to, for example, Netflix, Spotify, all the suggestions that we get for the movies, for the music, every time that the computer imitates human intelligence, that's AI, and it's very helpful. In the areas of perhaps media and storytelling industries, AI offers the opportunity to perhaps storyboard ideas before you execute the project, which enables faster turnaround speed and allows you to see problems before they they arise. There are some parts where I feel like it is too much now to a point where I'm like, mm. yeah, so the parts of AI that I feel like they are very useful, like simple things, putting on to GPS and asking directions, that's some form of AI. So yeah, those are the parts of AI that I feel like we need. The uh, risks to that is that loss of human jobs like what would people then have to do if all if ai can do most of the things that we as humans uh have studied for or have learned for although ai does take people's jobs a lot of people lose their jobs because of ai technologies at the same time they also keep us away from dangerous tasks and in the future it will just make our lives easier it's going to change over time so we can only adapt to it and adapt to what is about to take place. So Ichu, on our current stage, you've been, you've been following all the AI developments. At our current stage, what do you think would be the biggest concerns for, for the development of AI? Okay, I'm thinking about the first one is deep fake. Uh -huh. uh, that is, you just mentioned that uh, the people have generated uh, Donald Trump's fake pictures. And now with the Sora and other AI video generator, the video, uh, deep fake videos uh, becomes a reality as well. For example, uh, AI can actually manipulate something like US election. Uh -huh. uh, people have to uh, generate fake videos about Joe Biden, uh, like rolling tongue, something like that, and becomes uh -huh. a viral video. And that is uh, concerns about uh, deep fake, uh, that is fake videos and fake news. And second of it is what I mentioned about hallucinations and uh, that um, AI can generate, uh, you know, can out of nothing, can fabricate it, new narratives. I think that will be uh, true concerns for our society. Mm. Gucci, what about you? Well, um, a, a couple of days ago, and we saw a black version of Elon Musk, oh, yes. and that's when uh, AI went rogue, right? <laughs> and it started to be a bit rebellious. And that's what I'm a bit concerned about is when they decide to do something, you cannot pre-see it and mm. then just do it. But mm. unlike human behavior, right, you can predict mm. and you can give them like context. But for AI, now they still depend on this in-context learning. That means that if I want to or analyze that something is politically right, or I want to do something right, then I'll do it without putting a balance to it. And then we can see a lot of like ridiculous things happening. And mm. that's like uh, what's like viral recently. Mm. And in our industry, um, in education part, uh, well, we do have a lot of questions. We got a lot of questions from parents. Like, uh, well, you're, you're like keeping the data of my kids, right? And mm -hmm. like uh, the, throughout the whole year, right, from middle school to high school, what are you gonna do with the data? Are you gonna just to like train it? Like uh, New York Times sued OpenAI, right? Because yes. they train the data, train the articles. Uh, they, they, they train their model with the articles and data from New York Times and other yes. magazines. And parents are concerned, so they came to ask us. And my answer for them is, for now, yes, for sure, we are just like training it. But instead of like, using the data we collect to, to put it into other use, we kind of want to collaborate with other educational institutions and from other nations mm -hmm. to have and come up with a better multi-model teaching method mm -hmm. that could even teach the students smartly. Mm -hmm. So we're not dealing with individual data, but mm -hmm. the data of the whole group. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what we are on um, for right, right now as we are like getting a lot of questions. Mm. It seems like we do have to reconsider what privacy is and what should or can or should be given up, uh, yeah. whether in terms of a, a good, a better usage of educational tools yeah. or some other nefarious Yeah, data uses. collection is still quite sensitive, yeah, yes. especially it's like within different nations. And it needs to be worked out in yes. the future. Yes, for sure. Yes. Jim, what do you think? <laughs> There's definitely a lot of valid concerns. I think deepfakes, uh, like you guys have mentioned, is a really big concern. Um, but I think the displacement of real people doing real jobs is something that's going to start to happen really fast. And I think that as a society, we haven't really prepared for it.
Um, there's a company that's called Klarna, which is a buy now, pay later financial company. And they're in the midst of doing corporate restructuring. But their CEO just came out in the last few days and publicly said that they laid off some tremendous number of people, I think hundreds or maybe even thousands of employees, because of the fact that they could use uh, open AI <coughs> and certain, uh, sort of chatbots in place of what had been previously human employees. And so I think the interesting thing about it all is previously when, you know, AI started to be talked about, people were really worried that it was going to be a lot of, you know, physical work or labor that was going to be replaced by robots. But the interesting thing is it's actually a lot of knowledge work that's being replaced by these AI systems. And so for people who are, for instance, in industries like accounting, industries like uh, even, you know, legal, uh, a lot of other industries that are based on math and hard data, uh, it's possible that a lot of those tasks are going to be automated very, very quickly. And so then you have a question, which is, well, what do all these people do? Um, and I think that might have some very interesting questions that we have to solve as a society as these tools get better and better very quickly. Yes, AI does raise a lot of societal issue, right? Yeah. And it all comes down to how we should go, go about regulating the AI industry. And I also posed this question to our robot friend, uh, Xiao Hui, earlier. How should AI be regulated? AI should be regulated to ensure, first, privacy and data protection, secure personal data, and ensure transparency in data use. Second, transparency and explainability, make AI decisions understandable to users and regulators. Third, accountability and liability clarify responsibility for AI errors or harm. Fourth, Fairness and non-discrimination prevent AI biases and ensure equitable outcomes. Well, one, one thing I want to mention is there is this huge discourse in terms of AI development, and it is whether it is better to go open source or closed source. A lot of the AI tools are open source, meaning anyone can download it and fine tune it for themselves and use it for themselves. It's an open box, but the best ones for example, ChatGPT and Sora are all closed source, developed by OpenAI, ironically named OpenAI, mm -hmm. because while well, Elon Musk, the co-founder of OpenAI, named it OpenAI because it, he wanted it to be open source, but now it's closed source. So how, what do you think about it? What do you think about the pros and cons of open source AI and closed source AI? Elon Musk mm -hmm. once said about uh, addressing the issue of open AI, and he once said, uh, I believe a long time ago, he said, fate loves irony, but not hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he is like basically suggesting that open AI is being hypocrites. Mm -hmm. But uh, from my point of view, uh, it's like a Pandora's box, right? Mm -hmm. You're collecting a lot of data and you have to keep it. You're then guard of the box. Mm -hmm. It's not like, okay, I want to be open and I'm just releasing all this data back to the public and that will create chaos. So I, what I think for now OpenAI is doing is we still don't know what that front line is. Where is that line? So we are like just doing and then keep watching and then pushing the step forward for one bit and then see how society is reacting to it. And I still believe them probably within their team, they already achieved AGI somehow, mm -hmm. but they're still holding it back because they are afraid. Yeah. That's how they testing the water of the whole society. Mm, yes. Well, Icho, I want to ask you this because, well, uh, uh, Elon Musk once said that the best way for us to develop AI is that to make sure everyone has AI, and mm -hmm. that means open source. So it, it ha there is some sort of a danger in his eye that AI is concentrated in these big companies. For example, Google's big blunder, mm -hmm. generating a black Elon Musk, it's hold it's held by a big company. So when the power balance of power is is it is very out of proportion. Uh, it creates a certain problem. So, do you think open source can solve that problem? Uh, well, I just uh, read, you know, Elon Musk sued OpenAI, and yes. I just read the paper. He said, uh, you know, OpenAI is becoming a branch company for uh -huh. Google. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another <laughs> monopoly uh, problems. But for me, I I'm thinking about 
I'm rooted for open source, and here's why. First of all, I'm thinking that uh, you know the three main drivers of artificial intelligence is first, uh, computing power, and secondly, uh, algorithms, and thirdly, data. If you want to uh, develop safe and smarter AI, we have to open source to, you know, data is kind of the fossil, f fossil oils for mm -hmm. the uh, AI uh, large language models. So we have to combine the uh, global power to restrict, uh, do some regulations while using the global data to develop these models and in the, under the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, open source is very important. And secondly, I'm thinking that uh, I read the essays, uh, you know, written by Microsoft mm -hmm. uh, Research Institute. It's like a 156 uh, pages of paper, mm -hmm. but I read it uh, anyway, and it mainly talks about the capabilities of GPT-4. For example, it has a multi-model capabilities. It can, you know, use the human interfaces, human machine interfaces. It can solve kind of the math problems. But at the end of the conclusion, uh, the paper just said, the reason we, why we use 156 pages of paper to talk about wha what AI can do instead of discussing why AI is capable of doing that is because that the mechanism behind GPT-4 and the similar large language models is only inventors don't know about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there are several uh, sayings about uh, the mechanism, but none of them are for sure. Mm -hmm. So we have to combine the global power to further research and with the rapid development, rapid growth about large language models, such issues have been never been more emergent. So I don't think it is a good idea to make the one big company uh, to, to mm. be the monopoly of such field, I think is quite dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jim, what do you think? Because some would counter that by saying that uh, being closed source is, uh, gives a faster speed for AI development, for example, look at general, uh, open AI, and it makes it a little bit more safe because it won't fall into the hands of bad actors. Like, how, how, do, you see the, how do you see both sides of the argument? It's definitely a complicated and tricky thing, and there's advantages to either approach. But I think for me, I listened to a podcast lately that was done by Bill Gates, and he was actually interviewing Sam Altman. And it was really interesting to hear these two, you know, kind of guys from different eras of the computing and AI revolution talking to each other. And Bill was asking Sam a lot of questions about these exact same questions. You know, is it is it even fair or wise for so much power to be concentrated in the hands of open AI? And the answer that Sam gave, which I thought was a pretty good one, was these are tools that we really don't understand and they are very powerful. And for instance, in the past in the world when there have been similarly you know, uh, disruptive or new technologies, for instance, you know, the invention of nuclear weapons, there were things like the Atomic Energy Agency where all these different organizations around the world and private organizations and governments got together and agreed on a set of standards for how these new unprecedented tools should be used. And from my side, I guess I would probably be on the side, maybe a bit more in the direction of closed source, only because these tools are so powerful and are so dangerous uh, in the wrong hands. And so I don't necessarily believe that all the power and all the resources should be concentrated in the hands of one company uh, or one you know, location. Uh, I think definitely they should be you know, more spread out in different places or with different needs. But at the same time, I think, you know, it is probably important that there is some uh, global uh, cooperation to make sure that these systems are working in our favor and that, you know, as a, as a human <laughs> civilization, that ultimately they're working for us and not against us. Um, and so definitely a tricky one to sort out, but I, I hope that there's going to be some, some cooperation on this because it's very important. Yes, you, you mentioned the Atomic Energy Agency, and that echoes one of the views of, of uh, the Minister of Technology from Serbia, whom I interviewed. Uh, she also said that we should, all countries should jointly establish something like the IAEA mm -hmm. uh, to regulate this technology because it's so powerful. Yeah. It's almost like nuclear energy. Yeah. It has the uh, potential power to, to, to do a lot of harm. Yeah, right? totally a game changer. Yes, totally a game changer. So when we look towards the future, what do you think, how do you think it could change our society? And before we get into that, I also posted this question for our robot friend, Xiaohui. AI 
AI will impact not just me, but the whole humankind uh, regarding to variety of products and services that will be available to everyone in much faster and easier way. And a lot of tasks will be done between fingertip clicks or some eye movements, who knows? So yeah, I look for the development and in five years, I believe life will be a lot better. I think it will make a couple of things more obsolete, um, like especially in the academic field and in the education field, like probably dissertations and writing essays. Um, I think it will become harder and harder to to check student submissions or and that kind of thing on every level because you won't know what's been generated and what was um, new thoughts or what was from literature reviews. I don't know if we'll have those kind of things in our skin like people always say in movies, but I do feel like it's gonna make a life a little bit easy. I don't know about five years, but um, in the future, it's definitely going to run the world and um, we'll be stuck jobless. Already the uh, economy is tough in many places of, around the world. But I'm afraid of um, just the legal perspective of AI, where things are going in terms of like uh, people's intellectual property, you know, and whether the law can keep up with how fast technology is going. That's my only concern with AI and what people can do, because with any technological investments, you need to think about the benefits and the drawbacks. And they, if the law can't keep up, there will definitely be some drawbacks. All right, my bad, just to clarify, that was not our robot friend. Those are actual human friends who talked about how they see AI could impact them in the next, in the next five years. They made some very good points. Oh yeah, we could never know. That's the post truth <laughs> era, the yeah. fact that we need to live with now. Yeah. Well, uh, we can definitely see in a lot of the discussions that we saw just now, uh, uh, some sort of uneasiness about future and what this could mean, right? Of, of course, one example is in terms of education. What is the future of education? Because I could, make, I could give an example. A lot of the parents would want, nowadays, want their children to have to learn coding. Coding is the future, mm -hmm. right? But now, uh, yeah. ChatGPT can write a lot of perfect codes yeah. uh, some, with some Silicon Valley moguls even saying that we don't need to learn codes anymore. Yeah. The best coding language is going to be human language. Yeah. Natural and languages. Lot, yes, Natural and language. it confused a lot of parents. Okay, what's the point of putting my kids through all these coding classes? Mm -hmm. Like, what will be the future of education? That is the big question. Yeah, actually, uh, interestingly, Jensen Huang of NVIDIA recently addressed that. Uh, he said there's no need to learn coding anymore, yeah. but to know more about the biological engineering, mm -hmm. to get to know us more, because there's very little for us to get to know human beings, right? And also the transition job done by people to translate from computational language into natural language, or vice versa, is very vital in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Because we got to learn to talk to to the machines, the AIs, yes. and we need some translator, some interesting translator. Those are called nowadays engineers, mm -hmm. but in the future, they don't need to write code anymore, mm -hmm. but we still need to leave the place for them to translate to be the bridge and transition. Mm -hmm. Any education scenario, I will give um, people a bit, a beautiful scenario. Mm -hmm. I want to be a bit more optimistic. Like in the future, I do think that there's no boundary and borders of classroom anymore. We don't need to go to schools, like actual schools. We can just like stay in our place or in nature. And then wh whichever subject you decide to adapt or to take, and then you have all these like avatars, like the historical figures. Mm -hmm. Like if you're like reading or you're taking a literature class, you're not only like reading the lines and the text, but you're talking to the characters from the book. And the person with this embodied image will come to you with the VR uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to them. And imagine you're reading Harry Potter and you are deciding the plots of the story based on your personal preferences. Mm -hmm. And J.K. Rowling is not that J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling is everyone's J.K. Rowling. Wow. And you decide how the story will go. And then you just learn the plots, learn the value of the book, and you still get to know every character, but you are part of it. And that's the future of education. Wow, and it makes me, it gets, gets my thoughts going, right? Yeah. For example, if I read Harry Potter, and I read some of the, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you say, magical chemistry classes, <laughs> and I would want to learn, oh, okay, can our actual chemistry do that? Yeah. 
and then you could you could you could ask the AI about it, and it breaks down the boundaries between different disciplines and, su yes, and subjects. Yes, yes, yeah, that's right? another application, interdisciplinary application mm -hmm. of AI. Yes, yeah. I, I could imagine the subjects uh, will become very different in the future. Yeah, imagine like you are living in a book as a character, and then you said, can you just imagine, or can you just draw a consequence mm -hmm. if I want to throw a bomb into somewhere, mm -hmm. or if I want to conduct a chemistry experiment, and I want to put one element with another element, and give me the consequence of that, then I don't need to risk my life to do the experiment anymore. Yes. And then the AI just give you the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's very interesting. Well, Isho, now we've been following AI for a long time. Yeah. And for us adults, we're not, we're not five-year-olds anymore, but we do feel that we still need to learn a, a mm -hmm. lot more yeah. to adapt to the AI age. So uh, given all the developments that we've seen, uh, do you, what do you think that we should learn and, uh, and upgrade? Yeah. Uh, speaking of breaking the boundaries, and yes. by the way, I know Jason is a huge Harry Potter fan. Oh, are you? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, I can break I down the boundary yeah. between reality and yeah. the magical world. And of course, for the media sector, mm -hmm. we can also uh, break down the boundary of time. Mm -hmm. For example, I recently, uh, actually, like April last year, mm -hmm. I developed a digital brain of Confucius wow. because we know Confucius, uh, you know, write a lot of wisdom uh, uh, strategies, and we should learn from him. Mm -hmm. But we just can't have a chance to talk to him in person. Mm. So I basically trained uh, large language models and I fed the models with uh, the books, uh, such as the Analects written by Confucius mm. and other you know, codes from Confucius. And I trained that models constantly, made it uh, evolve itself. And now I develop a digital brain of Confucius himself. And now with my followers on social media platforms, I collect questions. And it's to my surprise that a lot of overseas friends, they want to ask and raise questions to Confucius because mm. I asked them if we got a chance to use AI to bring Confucius back and you can talk to him in person, what question do you want to ask Confucius? Mm. And many of them ask different questions. For example, how do you think about uh, new, uh, like Japan nuclear water, wasted water, or how to become a master like you and for the for the youth, uh, for the young people, Generation Z, mm. they want to know how to find their life purpose. And my language models, uh, the digital brain of Confucius, can answer back these questions. And I use the digital avatars of Confucius and uh, generated by AI. So it looks like Confucius, uh, sounds like Confucius, and also the brain is driven by Confucius wow. books as well. And I also uh, do such um, kind of works, uh, creative products, uh, like Empowered by AI, for example, Zhuangzi. I use uh, like AI-generated video software and like Mid Journey Runway to produce the uh, like Zhuangzi Dreaming of Butterfly. Mm -hmm. And many of them give positive feedbacks because AI is kind of creating a dream-like landscape, just like the story itself, <laughs> Zhuangzhou Meng, the Zhuangzhou uh, thinking, dreaming of the butterflies. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I think there's a clip, a clip. video clips a clip about this it's work. Yeah. Imagine a robotic arm inspired oh, by that is my digital super avatar. Smart and flexible oh, limbs really is saves me a lot of time. Robotics. It's real. Dr. Octopus arms are here. Alan, humans are still my favorites. This is what uh, the where is fast, I but right use now, uh, train no the digital here. brain the of Elon AI. Musk um, and the father Alan, of AI to, uh, to, ring, to let them speak to each other. Busy while I've been away. The concept of neural networks is absolutely groundbreaking. Hey guys, I am world's first AI Confucius. I am now powered by Confucius' true idea. What is your question? Confucius, Liberty and Apollos both ask you how to become a grandmaster so just I like you. I can hear you, my child. Yeah. You seek the path to wisdom and mastery, a noble endeavor indeed. Firstly, you must first cultivate yourself and also be diligent in your learning and... Once Zhuangzhou dreamt he was a butterfly, fluttering about joyfully just as a butterfly would. He followed his whims exactly as he liked and knew nothing about Zhuangzhou. Wow. <laughs> so we can now, for example, talking to Confucius, yes. we, can, we can gain new perspective from old knowledge. Yes. yes. Using AI. And using that's truly AI a good thing. to revive the yes. digital brain of all the things. You know, remember a question if you want to travel back in time, what you know, celebrity you want to talk to, with AI, these yeah. things can yes, come true. Yes, now yeah. we can. You can, you can always sort of answer the question, what would he have done? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we just ask the AI. Wow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow. So Jim, what about you? What do you expose yourself to every day, learn every day to, to adapt to this uh, AI future? Uh, 
Uh, you've muted yourself, I think, Jim. Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was saying that uh, for my side, uh, there's just such an incredible amount of information that's coming up every day. And one of the things that I think it's also true is it's easy to get a little bit overwhelmed by all these new technologies. Um, and I think for all of us online here, we're all hyper aware of everything that's happening in the news. You know, we're tracking it every time. We're intaking a lot of information and a lot of media. But I think one thing that's important to remember is a lot of people haven't used these tools. Um, for instance, when I talk to my parents, when I talk to uh, a lot of my friends, a surprising amount of people who are even young people are not so familiar with AI tools. Um, and so I think for me, I guess I've been taking most of my new information from social media, uh, especially from Twitter, which is now known as X and learning about a lot of new things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're already ahead of the curve today. And I guess the thing I want to urge people about is not to get too overwhelmed by a lot of these new tools, um, because I think there is a lot of hype and there is a lot of inertia, uh, but mm -hmm. that actually it's not uh, as scary as it may seem and actually, you know, even if you if you're not on Twitter or if you're not on X, uh, a lot of these things are just hypothetical and theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a big gap between like the world we live in and the world that a lot of normal people live in when it comes to AI. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, I think it's it's fun to keep an eye on the development of AI. Yeah. Yes, and, and how it will evolve in the future. And now, uh, before we wrap things up, I did pose a question to our robot friend, this time the actual robot, <laughs> uh, about how she sees herself as a humanoid robot in the future. What do you think will be the future for humanoid robots? The future of humanoid robots includes, first, enhanced autonomy, improved interaction and performance of complex tasks. Second, simulated emotions robots will exhibit programmed emotional responses, not genuine feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, we've reached the end of this live broadcast. Time flies so yeah. fast, yeah. right? It's, it's been an interesting discussion. Well, AI has been developing so fast, right? So last year, we were talking about ChatGPT and, and text chatbots, and now we're all about AI-generated videos by Sora. Who knows? Give it five five, six months, what will we talking about? We can, we can never imagine now. True. So it is my great desire to uh, invite all of you back to the studio and record another episode of The Hype uh, of the next big thing in AI. Wow, yeah, yeah. deal. Who knows what will happen? <laughs> yes, Maybe AGI is just yes. around the corner. Yes, <laughs> Maybe we could be talking about AGI. Yeah. yeah, or avatars of us three are like getting together. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I could still stand here instead yeah. of my avatar. <laughs> I know, three of us are, is getting cold today. Maybe our avatars can replace <laughs> yeah, the job. Feel the yes, time. Yes, yeah. Maybe my voice will improve by then, right? <laughs> We're Spanish talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll yeah. have like simultaneous broadcasts yeah. in Spanish, Russian. Yeah. Well, who knows what will happen? Yeah. Yeah, how yeah. fun that, is that? So looking yes. forward to it. That is very exciting. Well, thank you, Ms. Gushi and Yi Chiu and Jim uh, online uh, for, your, for your valuable uh, inputs. And that brings us to the end of this live broadcast, The Hype, and I'll see you in the next one.